Welcome to class 23 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. We have been talking about uh, uh, economic evaluation of DG systems and we looked at uh, a few measures for doing that. Uh, the simplest is the initial cost which is a sh short term immediate decision. Uh, payback period is something which is more on a commercial time frame maybe of the order of a year and uh, to make a decision on whether uh, a meaningful investment is being made in terms of uh, investing in DG technology. Uh, the cost of energy we saw is a uh, much longer term uh, time frame which is uh, uh, useful for policy considerations uh, and we looked at examples in uh, these uh, methods and uh, we have uh, we will start looking at looking at uh, effective initial cost and uh, one of the advantage we will see with initi effective initial cost is that uh, as a power electronic designer uh, we may not know the entire system which is being assembled together we might know only the power electronic part of the subsystem and uh, we would like to actually make a decision on whether to how to go about doing uh, the design based on a portion of the system which may not we may not be 100 percent clear at the point at which the dg overall dg system is being built so if you look at the uh, effective initial cost it is a way of uh, summing together uh, different uh, costs which some of which might be upfront and some of which might occur later in time. Uh, some of the upfront costs would be uh, things like material, labor, markup, etc. For example, if you need to build a power converter, you need uh, IGBTs, you might need uh, capacitors. So these are upfront uh, material costs. You might need controllers. You might need uh, human input in terms of uh, actual manufacturing process. Uh, you might uh, also need people to do controller development, etc. And you also have any uh, uh, company would need some percentage as a profit or a markup where, on whatever system that they are building. Once you manufacture, say for example, a power converter, uh, you may want to ship it to the end location where your power converter is going to be located. For example, you may be building a power converter maybe in Goa, maybe the wind turbine in which the power converter is going to be sitting might be in Tamil Nadu and you need to actually ship this thing across uh, the country and depending on whether it is a bulky device, whether it is a compact device, you have shipping costs, you in terms of uh, systems which are uh, used in uh, transportation systems like aircraft space size and weight is a very important requirement. Uh, also once the equipment reaches the end location you need to commission it, you need to make sure that the civil work mechanical structures are in place. Uh, if you are, you are sending it to a location where it is an urban area, the cost of area might be different from a rural situation. So depending on many of these things now reflect as initial cost upfront, which is fairly well understood. There can also be other costs which can occur when uh, you run this particular power electronic system on an ongoing basis. For example, you might have operation and maintenance. You might have circuit breakers which might need uh, periodic maintenance, the springs, uh, the contacts might need cleaning. You might have capacitors whose ESR might change as a function of time. You might think about replacing the capacitors after uh, so many years of operation. So those are future costs which actually uh, have to be encountered when you operate your system. You might also have costs on a running basis. For example, ideally we might think of a power converter uh, as being lossless, whereas uh, in a real power converter we know that there are finite loss. And in a DG system you might, uh, one might consider as uh, something that is being lost in the power converter as something that is not available for you at the load or not available for you as a, a unit of power which can be sold. So you can think about losses in your converter also as an ongoing expense over the life of the system. At the end of the uh, life of such a system, you are talking about uh, power, power related uh, 
uh, equipment, so you are talking about longer time frames of, of you are talking of maybe 20 years, 30 years, etc. for uh, a large uh, power system. So, you might also have costs associated with decommissioning. If you have electronic things, you might have to look at how to dispose of electronic waste. If you are having uh, machines, windings, etc., you might have value in the copper or the iron. So, depending on what the decommissioning costs are, you will have to make a decision. And uh, we will see how uh, uh, it, all these costs can be effectively rolled up to an upfront number to see whether uh, it makes uh, an effective design, which particular design might be more appropriate depending on your application. So, one way of uh, looking at a cost which is going to happen in the future is that if you have a, uh, 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 some, uh, some amount C, uh, if you have some amount C at the end of uh, uh, a year and if your interest rate is uh, R, you will have 1 plus R into C. At the end of uh, 2 years, you would have C into 1 plus R square. At the end of uh, P years, you might have 1 plus R to the power of N. So, if you have a cost that is incurred at year P and you want to see what is the cost today you are facing because of that, you will have the present value of the cost that you are going to incur in the future to be C in the year P divided by 1 plus R to the power of P. So, if you have some expense that is going to happen over here, you can actually reflect back to the present value. Similarly, you might have uh, annualized uh, cost uh, C A N N occurring over n uh, years. So, depending on what this annualized equal costs are, you can actually then take this particular number and take over the entire duration over which you are doing your particular calculation and sum it up to get the present value of say for example, an annualized cost. So, in this example, an annualized cost might be the losses that you incur in a power converter. You might know how much uh, uh, kilowatt hours of loss is there and you know what is the cost per kilowatt hour of, for electricity. So, in a way you can then reflect back the losses to an upfront number to the initial point to look at what is a effective cost. So, uh, many times what can be uh, encountered in the future can be reflected back to the present to see overall what would be the benefit of making one decision or the other way. So, we will look at an example where say for example, you have a 1 megawatt power converter and say the cost of the converter is uh, uh, 15 to the 10 power of 5 rupees and it is used in a, a machinery with uh, 20 years of expected operational life. And we will assume that you are in this particular uh, uh, power converter, you might have capacitors that might need replacement every 5 years and the cost of the capacitors are given. Uh, you might have IGBTs which may need replacement every 10 years and your cost of the IGBT is known. So, for example, after the 5, 10 and 15 year you might replace capacitors, 10th year you might replace your IGBT, you are given some interest rate which you uh, is, is find reasonable for your particular application. So, the question is when you decide on purchasing this 1 megawatt power converter, it is not just the initial upfront cost, you will have to also look at what is the uh, cost associated with the operation and maintenance associated with an equipment. So, you could then look at uh, what the cost could be. So, if you look at the, your net present value of O and M, operation and maintenance. So, you might have uh, capacitors 10 to the power of 6 divided by 1.15 to the power of uh, 5, 5 years uh, plus uh, 1 plus 2 into 10 to the power of 6 divided by 
1.15 to the power of 10. So, this is IGBTs and capacitors at year, year 10 plus uh, capacitors at year 15. So, if you look at the net present cost of, of your operation and maintenance in this case, it works out to rupees 13.6 into 10 to the power of 5. And then if you look at now your overall uh, cost including your upfront cost which was 15 to 10 to the power of 5, you will need to add this to actually reflect that uh, you need, you are making a commitment to operate this particular equipment for 20 years which reflects in the additional operation and maintenance cost. Okay. So, your effective initial cost including O and M in this particular case is rupees 63.6 into 10 to the power of 5. <coughs> so, we can next ask uh, say su suppose you have this 1 megawatt power converter. Uh, you have say three uh, options in technology whether you might have something which is the latest technology having very high uh, efficiency, you might have something which is slightly older or something which is now commercially available. So, depending on uh, the, the, the type of inverter which is being used, you might have uh, uh, say one inverter which is 94 percent and its cost might be 45 into 10 to the power of 5. Uh, you might have another inverter which is 95 percent, 1 percent more efficient which is 15 into 10 to the power of 5, so cost slightly more. And then you might have another inverter which is very efficient 96, uh, its cost is slightly more. So, then, then the question is uh, if we know the way in which your particular power converter is going to operate, we will assume it is 8 hours per day, 365 days a year and for 20 years you are expecting to operate this particular unit. Uh, and we will assume that the operation and maintenance cost is same as what we uh, calculated in our previous example. We will assume 15 percent interest rate. We will also assume the cost of energy is rupees uh, uh, 4 per kilowatt hour. So, so, we could then look at what is now the cost of uh, the losses that you are incur incurring in this particular equipment and clearly the choice over here is you, you uh, trade off between paying more for a more efficient a converter or paying less for a less efficient and the question is what would be a reasonably appropriate decision. So, if you look at the example of the 94 percent uh, efficient power converter, you can calculate the power loss. So, this is P in minus P out. So, it is 1 megawatt divided by 0 0.94, uh, P out is 1 megawatt. So, this is about 63.8 kilowatts of power is getting dissipated. So, if you look at your energy loss per year, so this would be 63.8 into 8 hours per day, 365 days a year. So, this turns out to be 186 into 10 to the power of uh, 3 units. Uh, or kilowatt hours per year and uh, assuming at 4 uh, rupees 4 per uh, kilowatt hour. This turns out to be uh, uh, rupees 7.45 into 10 to the power of 5 uh, rupees per year. So, then you could then uh, calculate what the net present value of your uh, cost is based on the expression that we just had. So, using the expression for the annualized cost, you know 
what is the cost per year, you know the rate, you know it, it's operating over 20 years of life, you can then calculate what the uh, net present value of losses. So you have the capital cost being 45, 50 or 60 in the 10 to the power of 5. We assume the operation and maintenance cost to be 13.6 respect for all the three units. If you calculate the present value of losses for the 94 percent it is 46.7 into 10 to the power of 5. Uh, for the most efficient it is 30 into 10 to the power of 5 because the losses are a lot lower. So if you then look at the, what is the overall effective initial cost, you find that the uh, what leads to the lowest cost of ownership or the initial cost is actually something which is intermediate, not the cheapest or the most efficient. You will have to look at uh, what is appropriate depending on whether it is operating 8 hours a, a day or at 12 hours a, a day. So you can actually go back and calculate according to your particular uh, design and see what would be an appropriate design. Uh, in this particular case, all the components in this particular system is related to the power electronic converter. So you could actually ha make such a des design decision without knowing much about the balance of plant. Uh, so, uh, so you can see that uh, uh, you, some of these numbers are good as comparison. Uh, physically, the present value of losses is not something that you actually spend out of your pocket. It is something that happens. So, so these numbers are more for comparison rather than absolute numbers which reflect uh, uh, expense that you will be incur incurring. But it can give you a, a guidance in the direction of what is appropriate or what may not be the most appropriate in terms of making a technology decision. So if you look at uh, the uh, different applications depending on whether you are designing a solar inverter or a wind turbine or maybe an automotive power converter used in electric vehicle, depending on the time frame you can adjust your, uh, your interest, uh, what is suitable for your particular application, uh, what might be available as an interest rate for a small business may not be the same as what is available as interest rate for a larger business, more established business. Uh, you can actually uh, uh, again keep in mind that uh, these numbers are not absolute. You are making comparisons and when you are making comparisons, you can make comparisons at equal level rather than use one rate for one particular comparison and another rate for another comparison. So you can actually make a decision on whether the technology that you are selecting is the appropriate technology. Uh, suppose you have, we discussed in the last class that many times because of the addition of a power converter, you can have benefits to the balance of the plant. So a balance of plant where you get benefit uh, can be reflected as a negative cost in depending on your particular power uh, converter technology. Also uh, people can refine it further, here we are just considered a simple interest rate. Uh, uh, you could also include factors like uh, depreciation, inflation, tax numbers, things like that to refine it. But th those are essentially details. Uh, the basic framework is essentially taking costs that can occur on the in the future or on an ongoing basis and reflect it back to the present. And people look at this type of design as, and people call it uh, cradle to cradle design, end to end point design where all aspects of not just your initial cost but also your operational uh, cost are included in making a design decision. And often as an engineer, uh, you may not just make uh, one particular uh, design. Uh, your, for your customer, your payback period may be important. For your uh, 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 actual design engineer, maybe effective initial cost may be important. Uh, as a company management who might be trying to see whether the technology is going to be uh, broadly useful to society, you may want to actually calculate the cost of energy. So you, it, often it is important to calculate all the methods and actually see which particular uh, method gives you justification in making a particular design decision uh, and uh, help you guide through whether uh, the power 
converter or power electronic technology is appropriate for uh, the particular application. So, with this uh, background in uh, uh, essentially making a, a design metric or making a decision on uh, how to actually go about do, with making a decision on your power conversion equipment, we also saw that uh, the role of power electronics is actually uh, increasing quite rapidly in uh, distributed generation applications and uh, your power electronic converter is actually an intermediary. Ideally, it is 100 percent efficient uh, at no cost. It is compact, lightweight, very reliable, etc. Uh, so, we will look at what it takes to transfer power. So, this is an intermediary transferring power from one particular source to another source and what does it take to actually transfer power. So, if you look at a typical uh, power uh, transfer uh, system which is based on power electronics, uh, what you would want to do is transfer power between sources. Say here what, what is shown is uh, two voltage source, one is Vn and the voltage source is V out and uh, you want to transfer power between say the two sources. And uh, if you use uh, components such as resistors, you always end up with dissipation. So, or if you use switches in a active or in the linear range, again you will end up with power dissipation. So, to get the best possible efficiency in power transfer, uh, the method that people use in power electronics is to operate the switch, the, the, the component as a switch which is either on or either off. Uh, a switch which is on, ideal switch does not have any voltage drop across it. So, there is no power dissipation. A switch which is fully off does not carry current through it. So, again there is no power dissipation. So, uh, I, a ideal switch does not cause dissipation. Okay? And the question is uh, what possible combinations uh, are feasible uh, for a network of uh, switches between say uh, input and output, what is shown over here is that uh, is shown is uh, two voltage sources and one thing that we can immedi immediately say is that uh, say uh, in this particular system, your switch S1 and S2 cannot be turned on because immediately they would short the voltage sources. Similarly, you could actually look at what are the other possible combinations of the switches. S3 and S4 cannot be on because the two voltage sources would get shorted through the switch S3 and S4. Similarly, you can see whether S3, S5, if you turn it on, it is again equivalent to shorting Vn. So, you will find that uh, in a, a switch network between two uh, ports, uh, input port and the output port, uh, you cannot really operate any of the switch without causing short circuits or uh, uh, you will not be able to transfer power between your input and output in an efficient manner. Similarly, <clears throat> we can think about what are the possible ways of exchanging power between uh, different types of sources. We just saw that voltage source and a voltage source, you can have problems. We will see that uh, with, even with the current source on both sides, you can have problems. If you have two current sources such as this, uh, you cannot open a switch uh, a, a current source because it would cause a large interruption in the current uh, uh, and that would cause a large voltage spike. So, current sources cannot be opened, uh, voltage sources cannot be shorted and even if say the current source are connected in series, one source will dominate the other and will cause a large stress to be applied uh, from one source to the other. So, both voltage source to voltage source and current source to current source uh, would not work well uh, in, uh, in an efficient manner and it would be quite, uh, uh, it would cause a lot of stress on the components in the circuit. However, we will see that once you have a voltage source on one side and a current source on the other side, then it is actually possible to have a, a fairly efficient, uh, good efficient uh, power conversion. And uh, it, in this particular case, 
the voltage source might be uh, a battery, it might be a rectified uh, AC voltage. Uh, a current source is typically obtained in uh, a power electronic application as a uh, inductor. A uh, inductor uh, does not like to change the value of its current rapidly. So, uh, depending on the design of the inductor, you will end up, you can end up uh, treating it as an equivalent current source. So, if you have a combination such as this, uh, the number of switches that you need can be reduced to just two, uh, S1 and S2. And to prevent the voltage source Vn from getting shorted, it means that S1 and S2 cannot be simultaneously on. So, either S1 is on or S2 is on, but uh, cannot be simultaneously on. Similarly, you need to provide a path for the current I out to flow. It means that S1 or S2 has to be on. You cannot actually uh, prevent uh, the current from uh, flowing through the, the I out, which means that S1 or S2 has to be on. So, if you look at this particular model of two switches S1 and S2, this corresponds to a, a single pole double throw switch. You can uh, think of it as, uh, as uh, we will look at the next slide, you can think of it as a switch where you either connect to the bottom or the top. Uh, so, your throw is either connected to your, your one end of your source or to the other end depending on uh, how you want to transfer power. And uh, this can be used uh, in a variety of configurations. You can actually see that uh, the basic uh, buck converter Uh, ex, uh, uh, boost converter, etc., are actually variants of uh, th this particular configuration of having a voltage source on one side and a current source on the other. So, if you look at uh, an uh, a example, a realization of this particular circuit, you uh, in, in a DC to DC converter form, you have V in. So, your pole is connected to 3 and because you are either in location 1 or location 2, you always have a path for the current I out. And because 1 and 2 are not simultaneously connected any time, you will never uh, create a short circuit in v Vn. Okay. So, it satisfies both the conditions for the voltage source and the current source. If you then look at uh, uh, what could be a realization of this particular uh, circuit, uh, if you think about it in terms of a, a, a practic practical switch along with uh, diodes or uh, to form a power converter, uh, one realization would be your buck converter. So, a buck converter is a simple realization of this particular circuit where uh, you have a voltage source on one side and your filter inductor along with whatever load is connected acts like a, a, a single pole double throw switch. Your, a boost converter is also equivalent to this particular configuration. So, if you have a boost converter,
So, the boost converter also can be thought of as a, uh, a, a, a realization of this uh, single pole double through configuration and you, it is possible to have efficient transfer of power between your input and your output whether it is a buck or a boost as uh, we are familiar from our polyelectronics courses. Uh, you could also have bidirectional power flow if you uh, with a buck boost type of configuration. So, so depending on your control you can actually send power in either direction and depending on how you send your power you can have a buck or a boost effect. So, then that, so the next thing that uh, we uh, would be interested in is uh, what how to actually make use of this rather than on a DC to DC basis how to actually generate a AC voltage. Uh, how to uh, put together an elem elementary single phase power converter uh, using the same configuration. So, building a, uh, a simple AC to uh, AC, uh, uh, DC to AC converter is uh, straightforward again assuming the SPDT uh, configuration for your power converter. So, what is shown over here is essentially uh, your DC uh, input uh, to be consisting of two voltages VDC by 2 and VDC by 2 and the midpoint uh, N which you might uh, one might consider to be the neutral and you have again the SPDT which can either be in two uh, positions. If the SPDT is on, on the top position, so if throw is at P. So, your V O n is now uh, plus V D C by 2, whereas if your throw is at uh, uh, n at the negative D C uh, bus, your V O n is uh, minus V D C by 2. So, depending on whether it is connected to the top or the bottom, it is possible to get an AC voltage and uh, uh, your value VDC by 2 or minus VDC by 2 depending on the position of your uh, throw. Uh, so, th the next uh, uh, question is how can we uh, then uh, generate a sine wave uh, from a, a configuration such as this because many times you are interested in interconnecting to the AC grid and the AC grid voltage is a sinusoidal uh, quantity. So, again similar to what uh, we saw in the buck converter, boost converter example, uh, converting this uh, uh, single leg, single phase, uh, single leg inverter uh, using trans uh, uh, transistors and diodes is possible uh, and we could make use of pulse width modulation of the switch by, uh, by appropriately controlling your switching action of your switches. Uh, uh, in the positive half cycle and uh, uh, for short durations. So, when you are talking about uh, generating a fundamental output, your fundamental voltage is uh, of the order of uh, uh, time durations, you are talking about 50 hertz or 20 millisecond. Uh, the uh, switching times that you are typically talking about is of the order of uh, tens of kilohertz. So, you are talking about 10 kilohertz, you are talking about 100 microseconds. Okay. So, if you look at uh, in this particular case your, your fundamental frequency is 50 hertz. So, your uh, T naught your fundamental period is 20 uh, milliseconds where, whereas your switching frequency 
uh, depending on your particular application, you might have a uh, switching frequency which might be a few kilohertz to maybe uh, even uh, hundreds of kilohertz. So, if we take an example of 10 kilohertz switching frequency, so you are talking about TSW switching period of uh, 100 microseconds. So, you are talking about maybe 200 uh, 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 durations of uh, switching uh, period per fundamental uh, in a 20 millisecond uh, fundamental time frame. So, when you operate uh, such a power converter uh, as a simple inverter, uh, on the one side you have the voltage source which is uh, uh, shown over here as VDC by 2 and VDC by 2 with the uh, midpoint being considered the neutral. Uh, the output is essentially uh, again a, a, a filtering action provided by uh, uh, an inductor. We are considered over here a simple uh, RL type of uh, load and the inductor uh, provides the filtering. Uh, so, the question is how, uh, how quick, how fast you need to switch uh, when you are looking at a PWM action. And essentially what you are looking at in terms of the switching period is uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, your uh, switching frequency has to be much higher than the frequency of the poles uh, of your system. So, from your, uh, your filter perspective or from your uh, equivalent physical system perspective, what is seen by uh, the, the filter is essentially an average value rather than the instantaneous value. So, uh, larger the value of the filter, you have more uh, integrating effect, so the ripple will be reduced. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the natural uh, averaging effect of uh, physical systems uh, uh, comes into picture and you get an averaging effect by the PWM operation of the power converter. So, if you so, <coughs> so, if you look at essentially uh, a filtering effect because of an inductor, uh, if you look at the input to be a step waveform going through uh, uh, integrator which might represent a inductor or a capacitor or uh, some electromechanical time constants in a motor type of system, the output is essentially going to be a ramp when you are having a step input. If you are having say a pulsed input, essentially you will have uh, uh, something which steps up and stays flat uh, as you proceed through the filtering uh, circuit. If you have something which is uh, having uh, 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 a pulsed uh, input with an average uh, of uh, 0, essentially what you would have is in this particular case, the output of such a waveform would be the integral of that would be uh, a, a ripple. Uh, the ripple would be uh, riding on top of whatever is the fundamental that you are trying to apply to the load and the, the magnitude of the ripple is uh, can, can be reduced by selecting a larger inductor or a larger capacitor for improved filtering. So, many physical processes naturally have integrators uh, in it and they lend itself to PWM action and the constraint is that your 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 switching frequency is assumed to be a lot larger than your uh, maximum uh, pole frequency of your plant. So, in such a situation, what uh, you get at the output of your power converter is essentially the average effect rather than the instantaneous effect. Uh, so, the averaging can be uh, considered. So, if you look at the average voltage, you 
your average voltage in, in, in the leg of your per particular power converter. Essentially, uh, when the uh, switch is on, you are connecting your output O to uh, P. Uh, we'll, uh, S1 is assumed to be the, uh, S minus is assumed to be complementary to S plus. So, S plus takes a value of 0 or 1 uh, and S minus is actually the complementary of that. So, you can then calculate what is the average voltage V O with respect to N. So, whenever the uh, when you are doing say a sine, sine triangle uh, comparison, we will assume that uh, say you are having a triangular waveform V tri and you are comparing that with say a duty cycle D and whenever the duty cycle is uh, larger than the triangle, then you switch S plus uh, is considered to be turned on and when the uh, D is below the triangle, uh, then we will assume the switch uh, to be off. Uh, in this particular case, we will assume that the triangle is uh, between 0 and 1. The duty cycle D is a continuous signal which belongs to the range uh, say 0 to 1 and it is a continuous signal uh, whereas uh, S plus is uh, is 1 if uh, D is greater than V triangle and 0 otherwise. We will assume that the bottom switch S minus is essentially the complementary of S plus. So, uh, whatever is uh, uh, if when S plus has a value of 1 then S minus is 0. So, depending on uh, whether your S plus is on or S minus is on, you can actually calculate the average value of the voltage between uh, O and N uh, averaged over a duration of TSW where TSW is your switching period. So, when, when uh, switch S plus is on, you have plus VDC by 2 for duration of T on. When, uh, when uh, your duty cycle is below your triangle, you have minus VDC uh, by 2 for a duration of T off. Also T on plus T off is your switching period. Also, T on uh, can be related to your switching uh, uh, duration TSW through your duty cycle D and T off is 1 minus D times TSW. So, if you look at then what is the this average voltage that you are applying over the period your V O n is V D C by 2 into D minus 1 minus D uh, substituting for T on and T off. So, you can see that this is equal to V D C into D minus half. So, you can think about your uh, single phase inverter as a amplifier where essentially you are having a gain of V D C uh, on an average basis that is getting multiplied by the, the duty cycle with some offset depending on uh, the value of your duty cycle being in the range 0 to 1. So, that uh, half correspond to the mid, mid, mid value of that particular range. So, you can see that uh, essentially in this particular uh, situation your V O N, uh, the D is generated internally by your controller. It can be a PI controller or some other type of controller or it can be some open loops type of uh, 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 a structure which is giving a waveform which belongs to the duration 0 and 1. So, this is actually a, uh, uh, a signal that can be thought of as generated by the controller.
and uh, uh, if you look at then the waveform uh, your uh, s plus s plus has a value of either 0 or 1 you, if you look at the average value of s uh, your s plus over at switching period the signal s plus is also referred to as a switching function the average So, over a duration S plus uh, to TSW, S plus is on for T on, it has a value of 1 during T on by TSW. So, you can see that the switching function and the, uh, and the duty cycle uh, give information back and forth. So, knowing the duty cycle, you know what the switching function is and knowing what the switching function is, you know what the duty cycle is. So, you can go back and forth between your switching function and your duty cycle. Uh, also, if you look at the average voltage expression, V O N average and you look at your duty cycle between say D belongs to the range 0 to 1. So, when uh, your duty cycle equal to 0, you have uh, output voltage which might be uh, uh, minus VDC by 2. When your duty cycle is close to plus 1, you are having a value of uh, plus VDC by 2. So, depending on your duty cycle, you can actually think about an average voltage which is being applied and essentially uh, uh, your uh, single, single phase leg of the converter acting essentially as an amplifier from your uh, voltage perspective. Now, once we uh, have a uh, feeling for what the uh, voltage can be generated in a, on a single phase basis in such a power converter, uh, we could then ask the question what uh, would be the voltage level that would be considered appropriate for uh, a given application. Often we are interested in connecting to the AC grid. So, we will uh, we'll see that uh, important factors is uh, factors are what is the nominal voltage and what is the range around the nominal voltage that one has to consider, what is the filter voltage drops that one has to consider and also effects such as uh, dead band plays an important role in determining how much margin you need to have over and above your typical voltage when you are selecting a given DC bus value in your inverter application. Thank you.